Hello, and welcome to the Culture Track at the third annual Python Web Conference. I'm Laura from Six Feet Up, and I'm thrilled to welcome Jan as our next presenter. Uh, thank you. So hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming uh, to my talk with the title Complete Python uh, Toolbox for Modern Developers. Um, today, I'll be talking about um, tools that we um, as Python developers can use to reduce um, our burdens um, in our development teams and by ourselves. So before we start, let me introduce me uh, a bit. So I am tech lead and co-founder at uh, Typeless. I'm also author of blog posts and courses at testdriven.io. Uh, and I'm also available on Twitter where my direct messages are open. So I'm glad to help if anyone has any Python related questions. So let's move to the, to the real topic of the talk. So um, when we are uh, practicing Python development, when we want to, to develop some uh, Python application, we face a couple of issues that are common to all of us. So we need to create and recreate virtual environments. Uh, we need to install and manage our dependencies. Um, we also want to do some type checking. We want to write and run our tests. Um, we um, at least a uh, majority of us wanted to, to follow a consistent uh, code style. We will also want to avoid security vulnerabilities, so to keep our application safe. And we also want to document our code so um, we can use it better and our users or fellow developers also. So let's start at the beginning. Um, so when you start uh, working with Python, when you have your first project, you usually don't have any problems with Python versions. But once you, we go further, when you uh, develop multiple projects, when you work for multiple clients, maybe, um, you easily come into a situation where you need multiple versions of Python installed on your machine in order to develop all of those projects. So the tool that can help you here is PyEnv, which is used to uh, install specific Python version. You can also list available Python versions on your computer. Um, and it uh, also lets you easily switch between all of those versions. Um, so for example, you can select a specific global version um, with the command PyEnv global and the version of Python you want to use. So every time that you will run Python inside your, um, inside your terminal, um, the selected Python will be used. Um, and you can also set just um, local version for the current project. So every time you will run a Python inside the um, selected folder, um, the selected version will be used. Um, here we have an example of setting global um, version and setting local version for the selected project and directory. So let's move further. So once you have a Python installed, once you have all the versions that you need, you need to um, manage your virtual environments and your dependencies somehow. So the first um, tool that you can use is combination of pip and vm. It's fairly simple to use. Um, it's usually pre-installed with the most version of Python. So you can use it to create virtual environments, to activate uh, those environments, to install dependencies, to create list of dependencies inside the requirement.txt file. Um, um, so, <laughs> Yeah, you know, here you have an example of uh, code snippets. So how to create, activate um, environment and install request package. And you also have an example of requirements.txt file where you have uh, specified the package and its version. So um, your fellow developer can uh, clone a Git repository and install the same dependencies in um, virtual environments so that um, he or she can start working on the same project as you. So if you need um, a bit more, a bit more power, uh, a bit more um, well-rounded tool, here is a poetry, which has a powerful CLI used for creating and managing Python projects. Uh, you can use it to create a new project, to install dependencies. Um, it can separate between production and development dependencies. You can use minus minus dev flag when installing a dependency to to install it as development one. Uh, you can run a command inside virtual environment um, by running poetry run and then the command. Um, and dependencies here are managed inside pyproject.toml file, which is the um, which looks like this. So here you can see 
the example of Pi Project Thomas. So you can specify which Python version it supported. Um, you can also install uh, dependencies um, and you can also set the author's name and other uh, metadata about your project. If you if you create a, a new project with a poetry, you will um, you will have a project structured like this. So readme.restructuredText, uh, pyproject.toml, uh, sample project, and the tests for for your project. Um, and here you can see how you can add um, a production dependency, development dependency, and how you can run a uh, command inside uh, Poetry virtual environment. Uh, you can also activate a virtual environment with Poetry shell the same uh, to achieve the same uh, state as uh, as sourcing um, activate script um, with pip plus uh, vm. A very similar tool to uh, Poetry is uh, pipenv, which is used uh, also for managing dependencies and uh, virtual environments. You can also use it to create virtual environment. You can specify which Python version to use when you're creating it. You can install dependency. It also separates between production and development dependencies. You can also run uh, comments inside the virtual environment. It's very similar comments, so it's pip and run instead of poetry run. Um, and here, dependencies are managed inside pip file instead of pyproject.toml as in poetry. So here we have an example of a pip file. Um, here you also um, set the required Python version. Um, so it's very, very, very similar to a poetry. Um, and here you have a code snippet. Um, also, how you can how can you create a virtual environment, install production dependency, develop a dependency, and how to run a command inside your virtual environment. So the question here is, which one to choose? Um, that's a very good question. So if you are a beginner um, and you're just beginning with a Python, I suggest you use a pip plus vm combination. It's really simple to use. And as I uh, told you before, it comes uh, with the most Python versions already pre-installed. But if you need a bit more power, go with poetry and or pip env. Um, here, um, there are there are not a lot of distinction between them because they are solving really, really similar problems. They try to give you um, NPM like experience. So like NPM for JavaScript. So um, they, all, they both have log files. Um, they both have development and production dependencies. Um, one, uh, one difference uh, worth mentioning is that Poetry has uh, built-in support for publishing a Python package to PyPI. It can be public or a private uh, one. Um, so it's just a one uh, common line comment. Um, while pipenv has more users um, and it's a, a bit more mature project, but on the other hand, Poetry has a bit uh, has more active developers, so uh, it's more up to date and they are um, taking uh, user uh, feature requests a bit more seriously than PPM. Um, you also have some other tools that you can take in consideration. So here you have a table in which you can check uh, which tool um, does which job. Um, so if you want, for example, if you want to manage uh, Python versions and uh, dependencies and virtual environments, um, I suggest you go with combination of PyEnv and Poetry or PyEnv and PPM um, to achieve the, the desired result. So once your the environment is stable and uh, your uh, teammates can recreate it. You can move further. So we can move to the Python testing topic and PyTest. Um, although Python has a unit test library inside its standard library, uh, the go-to testing framework for Python is a PyTest uh, because compared to unit test, uh, it requires less boilerplate code um, it also uses a built-in assert statement. Um, for example, a uh, unit test uses uh, multiple different asserts like assert true, um, assert equal, assert greater than. Um, so there are a bunch of them and it's uh, not easy to, to remember or to learn all them by heart. Um, it's also updated more frequently because it's not part of uh, Python standard library. Um, and it's simpler setting up and tearing down the test state because it has a great fixture system, which you can use to do that. Um, 
and one thing worth mentioning, um, it uses functional approach um, while unit test uh, uses a class-based approach. So you can uh, install PyTest with pip or poetry or pipenv. You, can, um, you should install it as development dependency because you don't need it uh, when running your application in production. Um, here you can see the most simple example of uh, a function in a test. So it's another sum function. Um, you just assert that the um, that uh, three plus two equals five, and that's all. So the the test is really simple. So there is there is uh, no no uh, no hard feelings or frustration when uh, learning how to use PyTest. So if you're using it a bit more, uh, the question that pops up is uh, how to structure your project. Um, I suggest that you create uh, new package tests on the same level as your production packages. Here you have, for example, a sum package. Um, and then structure the test inside uh, your inside your tests um, the same way as, as your production packages are structured. So as you can see here, you have sum and then you have test sum and then you have another sum inside of it, and then you have test another sum. So it's easier to navigate between uh, production uh, packages and modules and the test ones. Um, if, you don't have, uh, if you don't have test for some module, um, for some good reason, uh, just skip it inside test so you don't need to, to have exactly copy with test pre-appended. Um, so this is the code that would go to test another sum, and this is the code part that would go into another sum. Okay, so um, another great thing about PyTest is that it has a bunch of uh, really uh, well done and mature uh, plugins. Uh, to, to name just a few of them, um, you can use PyTest Django, which is a set of tools made specifically for testing Django applications. Uh, you can use PyTest XDist, which is used for um, running tests in parallel. Um, you can use PyTest Cov to add coverage support to your project and also PyTest InstaFail, which is used uh, to show failures uh, right away in, um, instead of waiting um, till the end of uh, test suite. Okay, so another important topic uh, when coming to testing is mocking. So mocking is practice where you replace the real objects with the mocked ones, which mimics their behavior. So when to use that? Um, use that when you have some external calls to some other APIs, um, or if you have problems with, with the speed of tested because of uh, database access. Um, so, um, or if you rely on something unreliable such as network or, or anything else that's not really deterministic. Um, so how to do that? Um, here, you, for, for example, you have a, a mock response, which is class that mimics the response returned from request.get. And then you use monkey patch, which is feature provided by uh, PyTest by default. So it's built in. Um, so you can use it to set that every call to request.get will be replaced with this function here. So it's a Lambda that takes arguments and keyword arguments, and it returns the instance of mock response. So you can access the JSON and it will return a dictionary like this. So you will get this result all the time. Um, and you can test your get my IP method um, with mock instead of actually calling um, to ipinfo.io, which makes your um, test much faster and much more predictable because it does not rely on network and external API um, for, the case, for the cases when, when it may be not working properly or your um, network connection is not stable or it's not working. So <laughs> I already um, talked about uh, monkey patch. So um, another um, set of tools that you can use for mocking is uh, um, located inside unit test.mock library, inside standard library of Python. It contains uh, mock, magic mock uh, classes, um, and it also create uh, contains create auto spec uh, function, which can be used to create a mock object that has the same interface as the one provided as argument. So here, instead of defining um, own class as on previous slide, uh, this one, 
um, you can just use create auto spec um, and set it to um, to create the same interface as the response from the request package. And then you can set that the when you call the JSON um, method on this um, instance, this will be returned. So this two code snippets does exactly the same. Um, the only difference is that this has less boilerplate code, so it's much more readable um, and simple to write. Okay, so um, I talked about uh, PyTest and mocking. So here comes the code coverage. Um, code coverage is metric that tells you uh, the ratio between lines executed between uh, test run and the number of lines um, defined in your code base. Um, if you want to, to measure code coverage with PyTest, you should use PyTest uh, Cov plugin. Um, it adds coverage support. So, for example, if you run it for, for uh, some sample project, um, you, will, you will see the, um, the name of file, the number of statements inside the file, um, the number of uh, uh, lines that were not hit during test run, and the coverage percentage. Um, so, and it's the same for, for all of the files. And here at the end, you have a total amount. Um, another thing worth mentioning here is that um, coverage percent is, uh, is not something that you want to keep at 100% all, all of the time, because um, you can have 100% code coverage but you don't um, actually assert anything. So all the lines inside your code base will be executed, but there won't be any assertions. So your code won't, uh, won't be checked if it's working as expected. Um, so try to keep this number high, but don't write tests just for the sake of, um, of having 100% code coverage. Okay, so once you have an environment set up and your code tested, we can start talking about code quality. Um, first, let's define what, what it means. So code is considered to be of a high quality. When it serves its purpose, um, its behavior can be tested. Um, it follows consistent style. Um, it's understandable, so other developers can read it and maintain it and improve it. Um, it doesn't contain security vulnerabilities and it's documented well, well, and it's also great if it's easy to maintain. Um, so we can we, we can help um, achieve um, for these things with um, quite some tools. So let's start at linters. Linters are tools that flag programming errors, stylistic errors, bugs, and suspicious constructs inside your code. Uh, for example, if you define a variable only inside uh, if statement and then you want to access it um, outside of it. Um, or if you don't follow the, the consistent style that's defined by, by linter configuration. So here you have an example of uh, three um, code snippets that does exact, uh, each of them does exactly the same job. Um, the only difference is, uh, is their implementation. So linters can help you improve developer experience by minimizing a fraction between different uh, opinions about, uh, about uh, style that should be used for your code. So you can configure your linter and um, it will tell you if it follows the, the, the uh, style that uh, your team agreed on or if it, or the, your code that doesn't uh, follow this style. So, um, a linter worth mentioning is Flag 8. Um, it's wrapper around PyFlakes, PyCode style, and McCabe. Um, you can install it uh, using pip or poetry or pipenv. If you're installing it with poetry or pipenv, install it with uh, uh, as development dependency. So you can run it for the whole project or just for selected module or a package inside your project. So here, for example, you have a code snippet and you have a result of um, Flake 8 um, run. So <laughs> Flake 8 will warn you if you use asterisk instead of uh, explicit imports. Um, it will um, warn you if you um, have too many blank lines or too, or too little blank lines or if you have too long lines um, and uh, stuff like this. So 
if you, if your code doesn't um, doesn't pass this check, you can reformat it so it follows the style that you provided with configuration. Um, okay, so um, we can move to formatters. So what the, what formatter does? Um, they reformat your code based on set of standards um, because um, after all, code formatting is a dull job. It doesn't really um, give any uh, added value for your customers is more for your developers. Um, so it should be performed by computer. Um, why should we do that? Um, we should uh, use consistent um, code style and um, if it's consistent, it, it can be done with a computer. So we should do that to reduce merge conflicts um, to, to make a code that's easier to, to read um the code that uh, in which you can easier uh, easy find bugs if there are any i hope there are not um and to easier onboard the new developers because there is no uh no creativity at the style level um, because it's just a waste of time so the first tool that you can use for for sorting uh um, not for sorting for formatting your code is isort which automatically separates imports into groups of standard library third party and local and it also alphabetically orders them um, as flake 8 it can be installed with pip install um, poetry or pipenv and you should also um, install it as development dependency because your application in production um, won't need it. Uh, you can run it for uh, the whole project or just for selected package or a module um, inside your project. Um, here we have an example uh, of uh, grouped imports with iSort. So here you have standard library, then you have third party like requests in Flask, and then you have a local imports from your module and you imported some method. So another code formatter um, worth using is uh, black. Um, this code formatter is used to reformat your code based on black code style guide. It's very similar to PEP8, but um, it's a bit improved for, for modern developers. Um, so your code can be, um, can be better formatted. For example, it, um, it has uh, a bit uh, a bigger maximum length for, for the line as a pep eight. You can also install it with a pip, poetry and pipenv, um, install it as development dependency when using the latest two. Um, you can also run it for the whole project or for selected module or package inside, inside your project. So um, here we have an example. The, the code at the bottom uh, is uh, code before formatting with black and this is the code um, after formatting with, with black so as you can see um, the code does exactly the same job but it's uh, formatted um, in a way to to follow a consistent style so uh, you as developer um, don't have to waste any time formatting it but just run uh, black and it will do the job for you okay so once your code is formatted um, and tested, um, you come to security issues. Um, you want to use some uh, security vulnerability scanners because your code is only as secure as its weakest link. So um, you, you don't want to, to manage it by hand because there are also tools that can do this job uh, for you. So let's start with a bandit. Um, it's a tool designed to find the common security issues in a Python code like hard-coded password strings, deserializing untrusted code, using pass in Excel blocks, um, and similar things. It can be installed with pip, uh, poetry or pipenv as any other Python package. And you can run it for a whole project or just for selected module or a package. Um, here we have an example of a code snippet. So um, Black will warn you about using eval um if you evaluate this string of code which is harmless because it just prints high um you you won't do any damage to anyone but if you evaluate um this string you can expose some secrets out of your system so um uh, bandit will warn you if you are using eval um to as uh, as a security issue because uh, it can it 
can uh, expose your system to for security threats. Um, another tool um, for for security is a safety. It's used uh, to check your dependencies uh, for known security vulnerabilities against safety database. Um, it can also be installed with a pip poetry or pipenv. This one is also a development dependency, and you can run it for for your project um, by running safety check inside your project. Um, okay, so we covered the code quality part, so we can move now to type checking and type hints. So what does type hints um, do? Uh, type hints allow developers to annotate expected types for variables, function parameters, and function returns inside your Python code. They are not enforced by Python interpreter because Python is uh, a dy dynamically typed language. Um, they are used to better express the intent of the developer who, um, who was designing a function or a class um, or a variable. And it also enables, uh, um, type hints enable autocomplete inside your code editors, um, and they can also prevent the number of uh, stupid um, bugs inside your code. So let's, let's take a look at the example. Um, here you have a function um, called daily average, which is used for um, for calculating um, daily average temperature from the list of temperatures measured in a single day. Um, so if you if you use it as expected, so if you provide the list of uh, measured temperatures, it works as expected. It returns you an average temperature. But you can also misuse it. You can uh, provide a dictionary for uh, input argument instead of list. So this dictionary has um, timestamps of measurements as keys and temperatures um, of measurements as values. So if you provide this one, no exception is raised. The result is returned, but re the result is completely wrong because um, the value of the result is actually the sum of keys just with the number of keys inside uh, this dictionary. So um, this is one of uh, hard to find bugs because there is no exception raised. Um, just the result is not um, uh, the same as um, you would expect uh, from, from your use case. So to improve that, you can use type hints. Um, you can annotate uh, your uh, input arguments. So um, you can tell that um, it should be a list of floats and that the float is returned. And you can access these annotations by accessing the Dunder annotations attribute of daily average function. Um, <clears throat> so the um, this is just the syntax which is used uh, uh, to annotate the types. Um, so these these are type annotations, but the type hints are built um, on top of this um, on top of the syntax. So when your when your um, functions and variables and classes are annotated, you can use MyPy um, for type checking at compile time. So you can install it using a pip poetry uh, or pipenv. Um, it, it's also development dependency, and you can run it for your module or for your whole project, and it will check if the if there are any misusages of uh, functions or variables or classes based on their uh, based on their type hints. Um, it's great to, to check um, your code at compile time, but the problem is that when you're dealing with external data, um, you don't um, you don't always um, can force that, the, that this data um, will be in the expected format. Uh, more of the expect type. So uh, you also can use uh, uh, type checkers um, at runtime. So one of them is Pydantic. It, uh, it uh, uses type hints to validate data on write time, runtime. Um, it's easy to use. Um, it uses type casting, which means that it tries to convert the, provi the provided data into expected type. So if you provide the string for uh, integer, um, uh, 
it will try to convert it. So if you provide the string containing the number one, it will uh, it will pass. But if you provide the um, a date string or your name, um, it won't. It 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 will raise raise an exception. Um, so yeah, use use um, such tools when you are dealing with external data. External data means uh, any data from external sources that you don't control, such as external APIs or your users using your user interface or your API or um, anything like that. Um, you can also install it with pip poetry or pipenv. Uh, it's a production dependency which you use inside your application inside your code. So. You don't uh, you don't need to add minus minus dev flag here. Here we can take a look at the example. So to to use Pydantic, uh, you need to inherit from base model from Pydantic, um, and then you define the class attributes um, and uh, type and add type hints. So um, which types um, is expected for for each attribute. So if you um, if you try to initialize uh, instance of song uh, with uh, data incorrect uh, uh, of correct types, um, everything is fine. So you'll receive it. Um, but if you provide an invalid date, for example, for the release date, um, so this is invalid, um, the validation error will be used from Pyventic. So your code will fail as fast as possible. Uh, which is also uh, great to prevent bugs uh, further down the line. Another tool that's similar to, to Pydentic is Marshmallow. Um, it helps you to validate complex data structures and load and dump data from and to native Python types. Um, it doesn't use type casting, so here you need to provide uh, uh, an exact type. So for example, if you take a look at Pydentic here, um, the date is provided as date string, but for Marshmallow, you need to provide an actual uh, date object. Um, and here with Marshmallow, the, the schema and class are defined separately. You can also install it as any other Python package with poetry or ppen. So for example, here you have a class song with ha which has the same attributes as the one uh, with Pedantic. Um, but here you need to define a schema. Um, you don't use uh, type hints here. You need to use fields from Marshmallow to define the types of fields. Um, and then you can provide some external data and try to load uh, a song. Um, and to load it, you you'll, uh, need to create a method decorated with post, with post load that will return a song. So here you, here you have an example of um created instance um and if you don't if you don't match the expected type the exception will be raised the, the same as for pedantic so another tool that comes handy when checking types is type guard um it it enforces types while your program is running um is it has type check decorator which can be used on classes or functions um, it also comes with PyTest plugin. You can install it with pip, poetry, or pipenv, um, and you can run a PyTest plugin like this. Here you have an example um, of a code using type check. So you decorate the class, and if you want to provide um, data of uh, invalid types, so here you provided um, set instead of list, the type error is raised. Okay, so the last the last topic to cover is um, how to document your Python code um, because without proper documentation, it's very difficult or impossible for uh, internal or external and external stakeholders to use and maintain your code. So documentation should be a standalone resource um, like the ones you can find on readerdocs.io where uh, many of uh, documentations from open source packages are hosted. Um, it should always be present um, because you may know what you're working now, but when you will um, change your computer or something like that, and you will need to set up development environment or you will need to develop further, or you will have some uh, long break from the project, 
um, you spend uh, uh, a lot of time to, to remember everything if there are no documentation, but this time can be, uh, can be saved by, by having a great documentation. So you can, you can come to a project um, after uh, six months and you're able to, to continue where you left. Um, and it's also uh, much easier to onboard the new or developers or users or whatever if you are uh, if you have a great documentation that describe your API or your package module, um, how to set up development environment and stuff like this. Um, so um, documentation should tell you how and when to do or to use something. So the first things that come that comes to mind uh, when documenting Python code um, are doc strings. So it's a special string literal, literal that occurs as the first statement in a module function class or method definition. Um, you can access it by accessing a doc attribute of module class or a function. Um, it can be multi-line or single line. Uh, so here, for example, this one is multi-line, this is a single line, this is also single line, and this one is also multi-line. Um, and doc strings um, have multiple formats. Um, to, so it, you can use a Google format, NumPy, restructured text, or EPI text format. Um, and they also support code examples that can be um, executed with doc test. Um, so when, um, when your code is uh, documented with the doc strings, uh, you can use Sphinx to, to build uh, an actual standalone resource. Uh, Sphinx is used to, co to convert your project doc strings to HTML and CSS. Um, once you have uh, Sphinx in installed, you can check that on their official guide. Um, you can run Sphinx quick start uh, docs and then answer some prompted questions. Um, and the docs directory inside your project will be created uh, containing these files. Um, so after that, you need to edit this conf.py. Uh, you need to, uh, to set the path uh, to your project, which is usually a parent folder of docs. Um, and you need to enable autodoc extension, which is used to gather all the doc strings from your Python files um, and uh, put them into HTML um, decorated with CSS. Uh, another important file here is index.rst. Um, it's a restructured text um, that looks like this. So if you want to import doc strings um, from your module to documentation, you need to use uh, this construct. So auto module, the name of module, um, here is the, um, the content of the temperature.py. Um, and then the Sphinx will gather together all these uh, doc strings. So from your module level, class, um, and um, uh, function level, and it will put that together into the um, documentation, which will look like this. Um, Sphinx is uh, supported on readadocs.io where you can host the documentation of your open source projects for free. Um, it's used by, it's used by um, projects like Flask um, to, to generate the documentation out of, out of doc strings inside, inside the code. Um, and you can also, you can also add um, additional um, content inside the restructured text files that can be um, also used inside Sphinx as documentation. So the last thing to talk about is um, documenting your um, RESTful APIs with Open API. So API is Open API is standard format for describing, producing, consuming, and visualizing RESTful APIs. It's used for Swagger UI and Redoc. Um, it also can be imported into Postman. Um, can be used to generate SDKs. Um, and it can also be auto-generated. Here on, uh, you have an example of uh, YAML open API specification, um, which uh, can, be, can be written uh, by hand um, in a YAML format, but it can also be auto-generated um, 
by using some external tools. For example, when you are developing uh, REST APIs um, with Flask and Flask RESTX, RESTX, um, you can use API models um, to describe your API, um, and this is converted into um, open API specification like this, which is used inside Swagger UI, um, and uh, you can access this on the root of your project, and then you can play with your endpoints. You can check your um, you can check your responses, requests, and everything related to your REST API. Um, in if you are using Redoc, you can also provide code examples uh, for consuming the REST API. Okay, so um, at the end we come to conclusion. So let's just check um, one more time which tools to use so when you are when you want to create um, and manage your virtual environments um, and python versions use uh, pyenv uh, p plus uh, vmv or poetry or pipenv um, it's the same uh, when it's, when you want to manage uh, your dependencies so install uninstall and update them uh, use pip plus vmv um, plus poetry plus pipenv, not plus or pipenv. Um, when you're writing test, I suggest you use pytest with pytest.cov and unit test mock library. Um, when you need to do some type checking, use mypy, pydentic, marshmallow, or typeguard. Uh, personally, I use um, pydentic the most. Um, following consistent code style guide, um, you can use uh, Black, Flake 8, or iSort. Um, the best is if you if you are using all of them together. Um, if you want to avoid security vulnerabilities, um, use Bandit and Security, and to document your code and APIs, use Things and Open API. Um, so that's it. You can learn more about these tools in a complete Python guide, which I wrote for testdriven.io. Um, and you have much, much more um, deep explanation and examples on how to use, how to use um, every one of them. So thank you for listening. That's all from, from my side. I, I hope you've enjoyed it.